Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Room 42. I'm Liz Fraley from Single Sourcing Solutions. I'm the moderator today. This is Jana Summers, our interviewer, and welcome to George Hayhoe, our guest for this, the very first Hi. episode of Room 42. George has done it all. He's worked in industry, he's been a teacher, he's been a researcher, he's edited professional journals and encouraged other researchers and practitioners to participate in research. He's here to help today to help us start answering the question, why should practitioners care about research and journals? Welcome, George. Good morning. Good morning, George. We're very excited to have you. So, so the topic of, of discussion is about journals, um, professional journals, and why should they matter so much to practitioners? Because there seems to be a gap. Is there a gap? between practitioner and, and the research journals? Oh, absolutely. Um, it is, I think, particularly felt by practitioners who think that the folks who publish research in journals have no clue what it is that they actually do in the real world. And it's also felt by researchers who are frustrated because they do research, they publish research, and they feel that nobody's, nobody in the world of practitioners is paying attention to it. Now, sometimes that's deserved because there's very little connection made in the articles and books uh, between the uh, information that they contain and uh -huh. the needs of practitioners. So now how do we start to affect a change in that? Is there interest from, because I'm sure even, you know, from the researcher's perspective and the, the effort that it takes to do research and to write up articles, I'm sure there's some frustration on their part that it's just gone into a dustbin and nobody pays attention. So oh, how, how, how do we start to change that? Well, uh, two of the major journals in the field, Technical Communication, which is published by STC, uh -huh. and the IEEE Transactions on Professional Communication, which is published by the IEEE Professional Communication Society. For each article that those two journals publish, Mm -hmm. They include a practitioner's takeaway. Okay. Uh, uh, typically, that's a bulleted list uh, early in the article that uh, highlights the information that is contained in the article that is per of particular interest or should be of particular interest to practitioners in industry. Now, there's also a uh, movement within professional organizations to uh, have a cross fertilization, if you will, between uh, industry practitioners and academics, the folks who typically uh, publish most of the research. Uh, STC, for example, has an academic SIG, special interest group. Right. Uh, that SIG has uh, sponsored a, in the past, I, I don't think it has been done in several years, but has sponsored in the past a mini conference with the Council of Programs in Technical and Scientific Communication, uh, which is an organization that's composed of primarily department heads or program uh, heads in academic departments. And uh, that conference has encouraged uh, a, a face to face meeting of right. practitioners and researchers. So there has been a, a real attempt by academic folks and by practitioners to uh, promote help this cross fertilization. Right, to help bridge that gap. So, and, and has that, how's that proven out? Has, I mean, has this been going on for a little while or has it kind of been a little rough? Well, it, it's hard to tell because 
we don't we don't have any real way to measure what the impact is, and uh -huh. that's a that's an unfortunate thing. Um, if you know anything at all about Scotland scholarly journals, there is something that's called uh, an impact factor. Uh -huh. and impact factor basically looks at how many people have cited an article over the past five years. Right. Not, not an article, but articles in a particular journal over the right. last five years. And that's helpful, but it really only measures the impact of the research on other researchers. Uh, back when I was uh, editing STC's journal, I published an editorial that was basically calling for a practitioner citation index, not, a, not in the sense of a citation of research, but use or application of research. The problem there is there's really no way of measuring that. Uh, we, can, we can look at sites of articles in other articles. Uh, that's relatively easy to do. Uh, seeing how measuring how influential an article is is extraordinarily difficult and sometimes when an article is cited or uh, referred to by practitioners it's kind of a mistaken citation or a mistaken application uh -huh. uh, I think, for example, there's an article that was published, I believe, in 1957 in a, a psychology journal uh, by George Miller. It's called The Magical Number Seven Plus or Minus Two. Uh, and it's uh, an article about a study in cognitive psychology that looked at how much information people can retain in their short term memory. Mm -hmm. and call upon easily. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very helpful uh, to know that you can only retain somewhere between five and nine bits of information in your short-term memory. But a lot of people have applied that principle incorrectly. And uh, I've, I've heard many people, well, not many, I've heard people say, for example, that bulleted lists or numbered lists should contain optimally seven items, seven list items. Right. Um, well, that unfortunately has nothing to do with, with Miller's finding. Uh, it's, a, it's a misapplication of Miller's finding uh, because when, when you're dealing with a bulleted list or a numbered list, you've got the list in front of you you don't have to retain it in your memory. Right. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that we're, we're looking at. Uh, how can we determine how influential works of research are in terms of their application by practitioners? So finding out how useful the practitioner feels the research is. Yes, uh, or how aware they are of it. Uh, you've got to be aware of it before you can use it. Right. I have to know it exists, right? Yeah. Like, how would they find? How would they find information I mean, if they're looking for like, is there research on formatting? How would they go about finding that information? Well, uh, one way of being aware of research that's published is to be a member of a uh, professional organization that sponsors a journal. So for example, if you're a member of IEEE's Professional Communication Society, you automatically get a subscription to the IEEE Transactions on Professional Communication. If and you, access to all the archives. Absolutely. absolutely, yes. Yeah, which is important because you've got rich archives. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you can go to that archive and search on the uh, terms that you want to find information about. Mm -hmm. Similarly, STC has a professional journal called Technical Communication. Same thing applies. You get a subscription 
as a member, you can go to the archive and search. Mm -hmm. uh, the Association of Teachers of Technical Communication publishes a journal called Technical Communication Quarterly. Same thing applies there as well. So that's how you can find information uh, from journal articles and the vast majority of research in our field is published in journals. Mm -hmm. And all of them then have a nice rich archive that's searchable, easy to access. Correct. And, and then if you don't belong to a professional organization, but uh -huh. you ought to, uh, but <laughs> you're in you, the profession. If, if you don't, uh, and I, you know, I can understand back when I uh, started my life as a technical communicator, my employer paid my professional society dues, and that was really nice. Yeah. Uh, but I am guessing that darn few companies these days are doing that anymore. Right. Uh, but if you don't belong to a professional organization, there is another way to find a lot of information. It won't be as uh, complete. It won't be as comprehensive. But there's a critter called Google um, Scholar. And another thing, really, I mean, if you're an individual in a profession, it's kind of like, you know, we should all kind of be a little familiar with dues. We go to the gym, we pay a membership fee. It's like, so, you know, it's not that bad to pay a membership fee, even that's, if your company doesn't pick it up, right? That's true. Uh, you might just have to pick one group to belong to as opposed to like all groups. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are five major journals in our field. Uh, three of them are sponsored by professional organizations. The other two are commercially published journals, and they are very expensive. Uh, so my guess is most people are only going to belong to one or two of those organizations if they belong to any at all. But there is another way to find information, again, not as comprehensive, and that's Google Scholar. Uh, Google Scholar is... Uh, uh, I, I believe the, the URL is scholar.google.com. The way that that works is that uh, Google searches the web using its web crawler and finds information uh, that has been published in professional journals and makes that information available. And it's searchable in much the way that uh, library uh, uh, university and uh, professional library database uh, databases can be searched. You, you know, define your search terms and, and search in Google Scholar and it will pull up citations. Uh, many of the articles that are published in journals that are only accessible if you have a subscription to the journal or your library as a subscription to the journal or to a database that includes full text. But many of those articles are posted on authors' web pages in pre-publication form. So you can see the right. original manuscript, for example, for an article. It won't be exactly the same as the final draft, uh, but it will allow you access to much of the content that is published uh, on the, the journal's website. Now, and what were those five journals again? Okay, uh, we've got technical communication published by STC. We've got the IEEE Transactions on Professional Communication, IEEE Professional Communication Society, Technical Communication Quarterly, which is published by the Association for Teachers of Technical Writing, and then the two commercial journals that are published by SAGE are the Journal of Technical Writing and Communication and the Journal of Business and Technical Communication. Now, those are pricey. Uh, the uh, journals published by the professional organizations are available for the cost of, of membership, which of membership, of course, right. has, has much greater value than only the journal, although the journals are extremely valuable. So how would um, somebody find out, like if, 
like, all right, so say I have a topic and I'm not really finding any relevant current information on research work. Because here's, here's the thing, as practitioners, it's hard for practitioners to find the time to properly do research. It's just the way of work. I mean, as a practitioner, you're in a very tight time constraints, your demands are different. The nice thing about academia is there is time. Um, they they are allowed. <laughs> There's, they're allowed bandwidth. And now a lot of times, aren't they expected to also be publishing and doing research? Absolutely. As well? Yeah. So how would I, as a practitioner, I can't, I can't find anything in these journals, how would I reach out and find someone who's doing research right now on what? Is there a, a, a way that, that academia notifies people, hey, we're doing research on this? Well, yes and no. Um, for special issues or for collections of essays, uh, there are typically calls for proposals that go out. Uh, we just sent out a call for proposals for a guest editor on a, 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 for a special issue on enacting social justice. Um, mm. That is one way to know that there's something coming down the pike. Mm. But that issue won't be published until March 2022. Okay, there's a there's a long lead time. Yeah. Um, and the, the the lead time is typically somewhere between 12 and 18 months mm -hmm. for uh, journal special issues longer than that typically for collections of essays published in book form. Um, uh, there's another way of reaching out mm, probably less uh, well, certainly less comprehensive, uh, and that is to contact the academic members of your STC chapter, for example, or your STC special interest group. Right. And that, and to to reach out to those STC SIG listservs uh, as a way of finding information uh, as well. There are probably other people out there who are confronting the same problem uh, that you're confronting and to, to reach out via the listserv and to ask folks, do you know of any research on topic X? Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's certainly one way to do it. Um, but it, it's, again, it's, not entirely satisfactory because it's kind of scattershot. Uh, one way to, to get research done on a topic of interest, uh, it's, it's not going to happen for the project you're working on next week. Right. Uh, but if it's something that your company has confronted repeatedly, that would be to partner with an academic researcher mm -hmm. uh, to let them know, well, that means you have to find somebody whose area of specialization is roughly correspondent to what it is that you want to learn. And, you know, ask them, have you ever considered looking at this question? Have you ever considered uh, whether uh, designing graphics for international audiences has, has changed over the last 10 years. Uh, looking at work that was done, uh, you know, uh, 10 or 15 years ago compared to work that is being done today and, and looking at how users react to the graphics, how helpful they find the graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how relevant they find the graphics. So one of the things I know we talked about before um, you and I was, was your interest in having practitioners more involved in the journals, right? Yes. 
so having them actually uh, writing articles for the journals and doing what, like mini research? What, what are the types of things that you feel are kind of missing from practitioners being involved in the journals? The very first thing is to involve practitioners in review of manuscripts. Every time I receive a manuscript, uh, the first thing I have to do after I've logged it into my database, I need to locate people who are uh, expert reviewers on a subject. Uh, I always try when possible and relevant to locate at least one practitioner, uh, one practitioner reviewer and one academic reviewer. And so having uh, a, a knowledgeable, uh, research savvy practitioner who is able to uh, examine a manuscript and respond to that manuscript with uh, helpful criticism, that's a, a big plus. I'm always on the lookout for such practitioners, so if anybody out there is interested in doing that kind of thing, I'd be very happy to know that. Yeah, that's what I was just going to ask is how would somebody say, hey, you know, I'm willing to volunteer my time to help improve these journals and I'm an expert in this field. How would I make myself known? I mean, you know, a certain sphere of people who know a certain sphere of people, but sometimes people just want to jump the, the that and just say, hey, list me. I have this expertise. And if you need me, I'm here for you. Absolutely. Is there a way for, for people to say, hey, I'm here? Hello. Absolutely. Uh, send an email to the journal editors. Okay. Uh, let them know that you're interested in doing reviews. I know in the case of my journal, the IEEE Transactions, in the case of technical communication, uh, we regularly call on practitioners to uh, do reviews. The more academic journals, uh, technical communication quarterly, which tends to uh, very often focus on very theoretical stuff or pedagogical stuff. Uh, practitioners may be less qualified to do reviews of those kinds of manuscripts, maybe, mm -hmm. not necessarily always, because lots of practitioners work as instructors part-time in technical communication programs. Uh, but let editors know that you're interested and uh, they will be uh, probably, I'm guessing, I know I would be delighted, <laughs> delighted. <laughs> to, to have volunteers who are uh, experts in, in particular areas. Like you said, I call on the people that I know. Right. And uh, you know, and a, know lot a lot of folks, but my uh, contacts are not infinite. And it's sometimes it's nice to get some fresh blood. And my comment to people when they say, because see, these aren't like big corporate sponsored journals, right? So a lot of these organizations do rely on a lot of volunteer work as well. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, my comment to anyone who usually has a, a vote of criticism is be sure to volunteer to yes. make a difference. Don't just point out that there's a challenge there, be a solution, right? So yes. volunteer. So it's nice to know that the editor is the person to reach. Now I know you're the editor for at least one journal right now, right? Only one at the present time. Yeah, yes. right now. <laughs> but you know all the editors for the other ones as well. So uh, yes, although there are transitions in progress. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I know personally all of the folks who are currently editors in chief, but STC is searching for a new editor for technical communication. Iowa State University's English department, which is responsible for the Journal of Business and Technical Communication. Uh, Charlie Kostelnik has just rotated off. And when I corresponded with him, 
a month or so ago. Uh, I meant to ask him who's taking over, but I uh, neglected to do that. Uh, but uh, if you go to the journal's website, it will list the name of the editor. It will provide you with an email address. And uh, again, volunteer. That's the, the best possible thing to do. Yeah, I agree. So what are some of the current trends in the technical communication themes, like for the, what research is going on right now? What is, what is it that they, I mean, is there a theme? Do they tend to gravitate towards one area or is it like all over all aspects? It's really quite general. I mean, there are, there are some topics that seem to be very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, articles on usability are uh, apparent in virtually every journal. Mm -hmm. uh, something that I've gotten a bunch of manuscripts on in the last couple of months has been social media. Uh, not surprising, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, given the current climate. Um, <laughs> But, uh, uh, you know, some of those articles have been extremely interesting to me. Uh, I kind of dip my toe in the world of social media, but I'm uh, a boomer and I'm, I'm not the, the most social media savvy person out there. Uh, but we published an article in 2018 uh, that looked at the influence of uh, Twitter tweets on the Dakota Access Pipeline. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, that I just found extremely, uh, extremely interesting and I think uh, particularly valuable. Uh, but I've gotten, I'd say in the last four or five months, I've gotten five or six manuscripts. And that probably accounts for mm, 20, 30% of what I've gotten mm -hmm. in that time period on some aspect of social media or other. But usability, social media, information, uh, architecture, <coughs> Pardon, uh, content management. Uh, those are big areas. Uh, and, you know, just about everything, anything else right. that you can imagine. Is there anything in your opinion that's missing? Like, wouldn't it be great if somebody took on this kind of research? Like, what would be like a dream? Not for you to take it on, but to toss it out there to everybody to say, hey, somebody do this. It's missing right now. There's a void. That's a good question. I'd have to think about that. I think there's nothing that occurs to me immediately because I mean, the universe is so large, uh, you know, universe of potential topics. Yeah. And my immediate concern is what's come over the transom in the last day or two or five. Uh, one thing <coughs> Pardon me again. One thing that is almost certainly going to be coming up in the next little while, and I've already gotten one manuscript on the topic, is how do educators respond to the need to offer their courses online all of a sudden? Yeah. When they haven't taught online before. Yeah, that that is that's an interesting um, shift, and it's funny when uh, so much was going to online, because for me, I'm so used to being online in a university setting. It was one of those things that I would never have thought would have caused such a challenge for teachers, but it did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I started teaching online in 1996. So yeah. when all of a sudden I, I saw people going crazy because, oh my God, I've got to take this course 
which I had planned to deliver face to face. And all of a sudden, like in a week or two, make it available online. And I've never taught online before. How in the world do I do that? Uh, but I, I faced those questions a long time ago and came to whatever solutions, however good uh, those solutions might be a long time ago. So it's, yeah. it's hard to realize, oh, there are lots and lots and lots of people out there who've never done this before. Not only university professors, but particularly elementary and secondary teachers who probably 99% had never done anything online uh, besides FaceTime calls with their friends and family. Right. And can you imagine trying to teach 30 kindergartners <laughs> online? <laughs> That's a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, one of my nieces uh, just got her very first teaching job uh -huh. as a, a drama teacher in middle school. And all of a sudden, you know, it looks like next month when the middle schools in South Carolina start up, she's going to be teaching online. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's, she's great face to face. How, how in the world does she all, all of a sudden adjust to, to having to teach a bunch of fifth and sixth and seventh graders drama uh, without actually being in a room with them? That's a, that's a big, big problem. Yeah, yeah. This fall is going to be interesting. So a uh, question. Um, back to volunteers and, the, and doing reviews and stuff. Just because um, we did have somebody ask a question is what um what kind of turnaround like if somebody were to volunteer to be a reviewer what kind of turnaround is expected uh, that's going to depend from one journal to another ieee is very sensitive to time one of the things that i have to report when our articles are published is when was the manuscript originally received? Mm. And <clears throat> when was the first decision made on the, the quality of the manuscript? Right. And, uh, I ask reviewers to turn manuscripts around in three to four weeks. And we provide a rubric that guides them through the uh, review process, ask questions about elements of the manuscript. Uh, so our review process is rather tightly time constrained, but we provide our reviewers with a lot of help in terms of evaluating the manuscript and, and writing their comments. Mm -hmm. Not all journals are like that. So what got you into the field of, of, of editing? Well, that's a, a good question. All of my degrees are in literature, uh, English and American literature. When I got to the PhD level, uh, the faculty members that I was working closely with, <coughs> pardon, did what's called textual editing, which is an attempt to establish an authoritative text of a work mm -hmm. and uh, I was working with William Faulkner and my dissertation director said this is a novel which has some particular uh, peculiarities it, it was edited to death when it was originally published uh, and about a third of the manuscript was lopped off so uh, it, the, the entire manuscript was finally published, uh, but there were lots of problems with the text. And so my, my task was to produce an authoritative text going back to the original manuscript and uh, trying to establish an authoritative version of the novel. And then to also do a critical study of, of the book. Well, when I got to uh, the point where I was looking for a job, uh, I had also done some work with uh, freshman 
writing courses as a, a PhD student. And I knew there were lots more jobs teaching freshman comp than there were teaching Southern Lit, which was my specialty. So I got involved in that and uh, wound up directing the writing center at the university where I was working. And we didn't work just with freshman English students. We worked with students working on all kinds of writing assignments. And so I got kind of connected with folks in the College of Engineering who wanted to help their students improve the lab reports that they wrote. So that's how I eventually got into technical communication when I decided to leave the academic world and make my fortune such as it is uh, in uh, the real world. I thought, well, what can I do? Uh, there aren't any uh, jobs for Faulkner experts in <laughs> industry. Right. So Not a whole obviously. lot of commercial appeal there. <laughs> yeah, very. So uh, I, because I had done this work with the engineers, uh, I decided the, the best place to go was technical communication. And <clears throat> so when I was searching for my first job in that field, I marketed myself by saying, well, I uh, have been able to edit fiction by William Faulkner. I think that I can help engineers communicate more effectively with their users. So uh, it worked, actually. And uh, I spent a number of years as a practitioner uh, doing software documentation and uh, getting involved uh, with STC. Uh, uh, I eventually struck out on my own. My, employer uh, offered a buyout that was too good to refuse and uh, got out on my own. And one of the first nibbles that I had was, how would you, would you be interested in uh, applying to edit technical communication? So <clears throat> I applied and I was hired to do that. And I spent 12 years uh, editing that journal uh, at the same time, I was getting my foot back in the waters of academe, teaching uh, part-time, uh, mostly online for Mercer University, Augusta State University, Utah State University. And uh, eventually, Mercer needed someone to direct their master's program. Uh, I had a good professional relationship with the faculty in the tech comm department at Mercer and they asked me to apply. I, I was hired and I, I taught there for 12 years. So that's, that's how a uh, Southern Lit person wound up in technical communication. <laughs> that was the journey. So what have you been up to lately? Oh, well, uh, I retired about four and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I was getting ready to retire, there was this editing position with the IEEE uh, transactions on professional communication that became available. And I thought that would be a pretty good gig uh, for uh, retirement. It will keep my brain engaged and uh, it would be... Uh, something that I enjoy doing. I, I really loved my job as a journal editor for STC. And uh, I've been very much uh, involved with the IEEE Professional Communication Society since 1989. So that was a, a, a natural way to kind of ease into retirement. I've been doing that for about four years now and I'm gonna do it for another couple of years probably. Uh, and, you know, uh, stave off senility, I guess. <laughs> well, I'm telling, because I mean, editors are priceless, in my opinion. And there, it, there's an art and a magic, in my opinion, to editors. It's just, they're uh, abundantly important. Well, it, it's work that I really enjoy. 
um, mm -hmm. because it's to me it's a matter of helping the author uh, reach their uh, audience more effectively yeah. and, and more directly. An awful yeah. lot of us are not as capable of stringing words together into a sentence as we think we are. One of the, one of the most humbling experiences I had as a graduate student was having one of my professors say, I, I passed along a draft of a, an article that I'd written, and he said, you know, you're not really a very good writer. And, you know, after my stomach and heart dropped to the floor, I went back and looked at, and he had marked up the manuscript, and it was, it was really very, very, uh, and illuminating in, in many respects. Very humbling, yes. but very illuminating. I mean, that, that's the thing is when you turn something into an editor, you have to check your ego at the door because they're going to tell you honestly. <laughs> but it's amazing how, you know, the, the difference, right? Because you know, sometimes when we're writing something, we don't sit down and write the entire thing in one sitting. So our, our tone may change. How, how is it editing research paper as far as, because you're tasked, aren't you, as an editor with the responsibility, or maybe you take on that responsibility of trying to make sure that what the researcher is writing, the practitioner can understand. Is that? Yeah. That kind of and, and that can be daunting in, in some respects because researchers have their own dialect, if you will, yes. <laughs> that uh, yes. can, can be mm, discouraging to, to audiences that aren't familiar with it. I, when I was editing technical communication, I got a letter to the editor from someone who just took one particular article to task for its uh, opaqueness, I guess. And I thought, well, I read that manuscript carefully. I edited it. It was accepted for publication. And I thought, that wasn't my reaction at all. And so, and I know there are problems with, you know, uh, reading level tools, you know, that tell you the grade level of, of a particular uh, piece of writing. But I, I thought, well, okay, let me see what, what the grade reading level of this article is. And then I'm just going to pick an article at random from Scientific American mm -hmm. and compare them. And, you know, they were roughly at the same reading level. And so I went back to, you know, comparing them and I thought, well, really, the only difference between these two articles is not the clarity of the writing at all, but the fact that the journal article has footnotes or endnotes in, in this case. And the Scientific American article really doesn't. And so, I mean, there, there is some prejudice, I think, among some practitioners and I'm, I'm thinking it's, it's relatively, a, a relatively small number that anything with citations in it uh, has to be uh, high and, and mighty, but it really isn't. It's, they, they've got a bias against things that have citations. Uh, whereas many academics have bias against things that don't have citations. So we've got- Cite, to, cite your sources, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you're um, making a statement, cite your sources. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Which is practitioners, you know, kind of get out of that habit of doing. Interesting. So what, what's some of the recent things that you've worked on that's really kind of stood out to you that's been interesting? Mm, or not editor, interesting. <laughs> as an editor? 
Yeah. Uh, I've been working increasingly with non-native speaker authors. And that, uh, you know, IEEE is an international organization. It's right. got mm, close to three quarters of a million members all over the world. Right. And increasingly large numbers in Asia and in uh, South America and Africa. It's always had a, a good number of members in Europe. So because it's such a presence in the publishing world, in the world of technology publishing, mm -hmm. uh, it's become increasingly a target for publication by scholars in those areas. And that's been the case recently, increasingly recently, with uh, the transactions on professional communication. So we have the, the increased challenge of authors for whom English is not their first language, maybe not even their second or third language, mm -hmm. which is a humbling thing in itself because I struggle with my native language sometimes and, and, and not very good in the couple of foreign languages that I've studied. Uh, so how to help them communicate more effectively in a second or third or fourth language, uh, how to uh, get them to begin to understand that they're dealing with an international audience because most of them have published in their national or regional journals and not necessarily in international journals. So now they need to uh, direct their ideas to people uh, that are half a world away, living in a different culture, both a different uh, mega culture in, in terms of society around them, but also in some respects, a different academic or uh, industrial culture as well. So that's, that's been a challenge. Yeah, trying to find the common language that both will understand, that common denominator. That's interesting. Yeah, very much. That's interesting. <clears throat> I, I see a question from one of the attendees about rewriting the manuscript. Yeah, that's what I was just reading. Yeah. I'm working with the speakers. Um, no, I do not rewrite. I, I try to be, to have as light a hand as possible, uh, right. not only with non native speakers, but also with native speakers. Right. Because I think the author's voice is important. Right. Uh, I, most of the rewording that I do is rewording for conciseness. Right. Uh, so, you know, making the subject of the sentence the doer of the action, for example. Right. Uh, rather than using a there is or there are or uh, such and such was performed. Uh, I try to, uh, to make the writing more direct where that will be helpful. Uh, but for the most part, it's the well, author. Because as an editor, you want the authors to be better authors, right? Yes. As well. Yes. So minor things are one thing, but major, you want the authors to improve. Exactly. And when it comes to non-native speaker authors, uh, I have frequently recommended that they find a native speaker who can edit their English mm -hmm. uh, to, to make it conform to the rules of grammar and usage. Uh, and, you know, IEEE does have resources available for cost. Uh, 
to, to help authors do that. Many authors have access to uh, someone in their uh, university who can, who can do that uh, work for them, or they have professional connections who okay. can, uh, can help them out. Okay, well, and I think um, we're, we're close to the time, but I think you don't you have something coming up in September? I do. Uh, Pam Brewer and I have uh, completely reworked practically from the ground up a book called A Research Primer for Technical Communication Methods, Exemplars, and Analyses that Mike Hughes from uh, recently retired from IBM and I wrote about 12 years ago. Uh, it is scheduled to be out in September in a uh -huh. second edition that has been, as I said, extensively reworked. Lots of new material. All of the exemplar and analysis chapters are completely new. We've added uh, uh, entirely new articles, uh, for each uh, research article type and uh, new analyses of those articles, of course. And we've added uh, a new chapter on uh, usability study methods and a new chapter on uh, usability study exemplar and analysis. So nice. we're really excited about that. Uh, it's being published by Taylor and Francis. Uh, again, it should be available in September. And it is directed at a dual audience of students of technical communication, particularly advanced undergraduates and graduate students, uh -huh. as well as at practitioners who are interested either in doing research on the job or in being informed consumers of research. So I uh, will put in a plug for that. Nice. And we're, we'll um, post that link to that information as well. And of course, anyone who wants to reach out to you can just go ahead and pop you an email, right? Absolutely. Because you don't, uh, you don't bother with a website now. And so the best way to reach you is LinkedIn or your email, right? My email address uh, is H-A-Y-H-O-E underscore G at Mercer.edu. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you. It has been a delight talking with you. I've enjoyed our conversation. And I'm so glad to have had you here in room 42. And hopefully we'll have you back again one day. That would be nice. I enjoyed thank it. So much. Thank you so much, George. That was thank thank you. Oh, my, my cats are attacking me from behind now. They've been pretty good this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and my dog hasn't barked once. And that's got to be a record. Right? <laughs> My cats have been pretty good, but now they're starting to attack me from behind. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for, for joining us. And I look forward to talking with you again. And have a Thank great you. day. And links to everything are on the event page. Thank you, George. Thank you, Janice, Thank you. for such a great interview. And we appreciate it. Everyone who thanks came everybody. today. Bye. Bye. <laughs>